so got it okay good afternoon colleagues um my name is anam nyembezi and i uh, am a senior lecturer at the school of public health in the university of western cape i teach health promotion uh in public uh, health and it's a, a module that we uh, teach uh, both at a postgraduate diploma level and at a master's level. So what we normally do uh, is that during the year, we, we will have two uh, uh, summer school and the winter school. So for a week, uh, we will invite our students to come and join us. Uh, and then uh, in uh, winter, we'll invite even people that are not our students to join us uh, to discuss health promotion. So because of COVID, now nah, we were unable to organize these sessions uh, for the past two years. So we felt like maybe let's have uh, two webinars uh, just to, to hear from you and, uh, and, and, and share with you the current thinking and practice in health promotion and, and use COVID-19 as an example of, uh, as a way of showcasing uh, the importance of health promotion during this pandemic. Uh, and um, uh, so what I did, I, I organized uh, two webinars uh, and unfortunately last week we had some technical uh, problems and, and we're combining those webinars today. So we are very um, looking forward to the discussion. We'll discuss both topics. So in terms of the, uh, the program for today, what we have uh, is um, we will have a topic on the health in all policies uh, as a health promotion strategy for COVID-19. And our speaker is uh, Peter, uh, who is a um, uh, I met Peter when I started at the School of Public Health. He used to teach uh, health promotion and uh, he, he's always uh, a knowledgeable person, always interesting uh, to listen to his uh, uh, speak, uh, to, this, to, his, to his lectures. So he, he, he will do that 30 minutes uh, and then uh, we will have a Q and A because we thought for those of you that are only interested in that topic, then maybe you can uh, ask questions um, and then we'll respond to you. Uh, if you can, uh, please also put them in the chat. We will, after his presentation, uh, respond to your questions. And then uh, he will be followed by Muris, uh, who is the director for Southern African Alcohol Police Alliance. And and, and these, these are the people that uh, for all the times when um, I, I, I have, uh, the winter or summer school, I will invite them to the uh, to, to the winter school and they will present their work because they're in the ground. So um, it, it is very interesting always to hear from them uh, the kind of passion they have for health promotion. Uh, so he will present for 30 minutes and then uh, we'll ask questions and comments and then We'll have a 20 minutes discussion uh, where we will also maybe hear from you, your own experiences, uh, if you can share with us. We don't know who is in the audience. Maybe we we can learn a lot from, from, from your colleagues. In fact, that, that, that's an expectation to share among us. And then uh, Prof. Uh, Alakwake, who is uh, the, uh, I know he's no longer the new member now of the school, he joined this year though, uh, and um, he will be doing closing remarks. He has um, a lot of experience with health promotion uh, and, and, and I'm sure that he will be listening and he will be giving us a good closing remark. So colleagues, uh, I think uh, my 10 minutes is, is over now. It, it, it's just so exciting to uh, have you, uh, I've, I've missed talking to people after a long time. So it's, it's, it's always good too. So if, if I, I can maybe say that uh, some of the ground rules that we will apply, I mean, most of us have attended so many webinars by now. So we, we, we muted all of you and then we'll unmute the speakers. And then 
if you have a question during the Q&A, you can unmute yourself uh, and then you can pose your question. And then uh, I also said that you can put it in the chat, we'll read it out. Uh, and then uh, another thing is that we are recording this uh, webinars. Um, and then uh, please, if you have any reservations, uh, talk to us. Uh, but we 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 we're doing this for our students also to benefit from these topics, uh, and then um, we 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 we're looking forward to engage with you. Otherwise, uh, those are our uh, our rules. Uh, we, we're looking forward to having a conversation with all of you. Then I will uh, then uh, hand over to Peter to do his presentation. I I hope I I. I allowed you to share. Let me stop sharing my screen and then I will. Thanks, Anam, for that very kind introduction. Yeah. I'm just gonna have to give you the heads up. I might be dropping out after four due to the by no famous load shedding and the hotspot doesn't always work, but it will probably give me just enough time to uh, for the presentation and the Q&A. Okay. Can you see that all right? Yes, yes, we can see. Excellent. So thanks again, Anam, for the introduction. Uh, and I will just briefly introduce the subject of health in all policies to you for those who are not familiar with the strategy and talk specifically about how this has been um, applied during COVID-19 in various government strategies to build platforms for intersectoral collaboration and how that has panned out. So the presentation that I'm going to share with you uh, consists of a few elements, introduction, talking about health and all policies, where does it come from, what is it, a few case studies, just to give you the background, set the scene and uh, the context, and then zooming in on COVID-19 and health and all policies, what has happened and how is that played out in the Western Cape? And more importantly, what are the opportunities for taking the agenda forward in the new normal? So as you know or may not know, uh, health promotion and health in all policies more in particular is actually one of the basic principles of health promotion according to the by now famous Ottawa Charter, which is like the cornerstone of health promotion as a discipline, as you, as you know, the Ottawa Charter that was launched in 1986 at the Ottawa Conference in Canada. Now, in the South African National Health Promotion Policy and Strategy, uh, well, the last one, uh, essentially, that was for the period 2015-19, health promotion was also considered to be intersectoral, as you can see on this slide, and involves the collaboration of agencies from different sectors. So it is multidisciplinary and it needs to be considered in all legislative policy planning and other spaces of the public sector. So this is quite a mouthful, but it clearly speaks to the importance of putting health promotion at the central stage of everything that is public service oriented. And it is also a very strong values driven uh, discipline as it advocates for equity and social justice. So what is health in all policies? Well, as you can imagine, um, it is just basically, to put it very simply, um, and the need to collaborate across sectors to assess the impact of any public health or any public service policy decisions for that matter, in terms of its impacts on the health and well-being of the population. So that can entail collaborations between different government departments like the, the natural collaborations that exist, for example, between the Department of Health and the Department of Education, when we consider the Healthy Schools Program, for example. It can also involve housing, transportation, and Department of Labor and Employment, and other sectors. And the ones that are probably more, uh, more problematic at times, maybe, for example, the, the, the collaboration or the intersectoral collaboration between the Department of Health and the Department of Trade and Industry, Think about the conflicts of interest that arose during the lead up to the implementation of the sugar tax in South Africa. So there is obviously a clear rationale for implementing health and all policies, because as we all know, 
health at an individual level is not only determined by individual lifestyle factors and age and genetic factors, the irreversible ones, but also by what we call the upstream, the wider determinants of health that are situated both at meso and macro level. Meso level, including the community, the peer networks, the friends, family, schools, workplaces, and so on. And the macro environment is the larger environment, not only the built and natural, but also the political, economic climate, socioeconomic triggers of poverty and inequality that determine how people will experience their life and well-being. And that is all situated, of course, within a global context. They have international trade agreements and geopolitics at play. So all of that forms a complex web that will ultimately determine the health and well-being of people at individual level. It is important to notice that health in all policies is also very much a rights-based approach. So it is founded on health-related rights and obligations. That is important to keep in mind when you want to do advocacy because it's an angle that you can use to put health and health promotion on the political agenda because it is enshrined, it is to be seen within a wider um, legislative framework of the United Nations Convention on the Human Rights, for example. So it actually obliges policymakers to be held accountable for any health impacts that is being made at all levels of public policymaking. It also includes a focus and emphasis on the consequences of any public policies on health systems and their determinants. And finally, it contributes to sustainable development. So it has become important and increasingly so over the years, especially in the lead up to the sustainable development goals. So going past the Millennium Development Goals it has become an agenda item on the high level meetings of the United Nations and the WHO. There is quite a long background to health in all policies. It can actually be traced back to the Alma Ata uh, Alma Declaration on Primary Healthcare in 1978, uh, where it was already uh, on the agenda based on a new world order. At the time, um, it was based on principles of community engagement, participation, and looking at the impact of policy decisions on the health sphere of populations. It was formally enshrined in the Ottawa Charter, as I mentioned previously, in 1986. And then thereafter, uh, there has been consecutive conferences, uh, World Health Organization conferences on health promotion specifically, Adelaide, Sunsvall, Helsinki, and so forth, where this principle has been reiterated because it, it, it can be traced back to the building healthy public policies in the Ottawa Charter. That is one of the five action domains in uh, working within health promotion. So it has been expanded from building healthy public, public policies towards using a health and all policies approach. It has also given, been given different names over the years. It started by uh, being used in the term of intersectoral collaboration to make it more pragmatic and concise, working across sectors and spheres within governments. It has also been expanded towards, uh, mostly in the Australian context, what is being referred to as joined up approaches, joined up governments, and later whole of society and whole of government approaches. And that is also what is being used right now in the Western Cape as I will show you later. So there has also been other conferences, as you know, on NCDs and social determinants of health that has somehow pushed the agenda and put it higher on the, uh, on the radar of policymakers worldwide. One of the more important conferences in this regard has been the second Adelaide conference and statement on health and all policies in 2017. Adelaide has always been like a pioneer in developing the concept of health and all policies. And I have a broad experience uh, and set of toolkits, if you want, of how to go and how to implement health and all policies in a very pragmatic way. They have issued lots of different documents and recommendations outlining, for example, how clear mandates can make a joined up governance or a whole of governments in imperative and successful they have talked about how to put in place systematic processes that take into account the interactions across sectors and how to mediate across those interests. Other points of interest are obviously the accountability, transparency, and how participation um, can make an, an intervention successful or not. So it is all about stakeholder engagement. It is about building relationships of trust. 
it is about crossing boundaries within confined spaces so it is a sometimes tricky but mostly diplomatic acts that largely builds on what you could call soft skills and those are typically um, part and parcel of the health promotion competencies skill sets so building soft skills is an imperative for any health promotion practitioner so to cut a long story short health in all policies were defined at the uh, not the last but the one before that the helsinki health promotion conference in uh, finland talking about how health in all policies should be mandated and put again in uh, political agendas and national governmental mandates so they also issued a toolkit and an mne evaluation tool framework for implementation and follow-up of how this was going to be implemented now across the globe it has been institutionalized to some extent in the european union uh, earlier especially when finland one of the pioneers in health promotion and especially health and all policies uh, became the president or the chair, uh, sharing country of the european presidency so they defined health and all policies as an approach to public policies across sectors that systematically takes into account the health implications of any decisions seeks synergies and avoids harmful health impacts of decisions made in the public sector in order to improve population health and also importantly health equity so the right to obtain an equal an equally qualitative uh, sufficient and affordable health care for people in a given society so who has spent quite some time uh, paying attention to the principle of health in all policies and it has also been taken uh, it has also been integrated if you want in the in the lead up and then the, the the declaration of the sustainable development goals based on three notions so for the who the most the, the three important elements are good governance health literacy and healthy cities because of the increasing trends towards urbanization the still large um, amount of health illiteracy that is prevailing and the principles of good governance that need to be taken into account when working towards whole of society and whole of governance approaches so this is just to point out that health promotion has become important on the political agenda and on the global public health agenda because it speaks directly to different sdgs not only health but also of course the other indicators it can be maternal and child health poverty it can be um, urban planning and so forth so it interlinks with the other sdgs and hence health has become a, and health promotion more in particular has become a, a, a central player and even more so in view of the rising burden of non-communicable diseases where a health promotion plays a pivotal role in the african region who afro has also published reports on uh, or a position statement rather on health and all policy some time back already years ago when they outlined several case studies that were shown as proof of what can be done in a local context in south africa as you can see on the right hand side the most famous example of health and all policies or intersectoral collaboration to narrow it down has been the healthy schools program aside from that tobacco control and salt reduction are also showcased as examples of intersectoral collaboration but these are typically as what one how they would be called in health promotion issue driven policies so they center around one specific uh, issue or, or topic rather than a broad transversal intergovernmental sort of platform based uh, policy so the healthy schools program in south africa well, it's obviously it was based on shared policy concerns in the health and education sector it quickly gained traction after 1994 um, from within the new constitution and and the view that well that education leading to a healthier population should be supported by um, a health policy and by that i mean that both go hand in hand and that it is pivotal to reaching the uh, uh, the national development targets to most of all to look at the younger populations and to make sure that they have access to adequate spaces for entertainment adequate nutrition and reach the full potential in terms of uh, development 
So there has been a role allocated to provincial departments, local authorities, and a lot of technical support teams and community actors. So far, there has been limited evidence on the evaluation of health uh, impact, on the impact on health rather. Although there has been lots of um, encouraging um, reports on improved cross-sectoral and intersectoral collaboration and process objectives being met. As you know, in health promotion, it's quite difficult to prove evidence of effectiveness in large scale or real world settings, because we're not talking about um, randomized cluster trials or the golden standards of how to provide power in terms of evidence. When you work within health promotion, within real world settings in life populations, it is difficult to create control groups. You have to deal with lots of confounding factors as interfering um, interventions. It is difficult to tease out the exact components of an intervention that will make or, or, or break a program, if you want. However, there has been growing demand for support of an institutionalized support, support uh, of the Healthy Schools program, including guidelines and roles and responsibilities, which is always an important issue, clearly outlining who does what, consistent training budgets, and also M and E to, well, to show proof of evidence. Another example in the Western Cape specifically is the Integrated Violence Prevention Policy Framework launched by the Western Cape government in 2012. Why will violence is typically a, a multifaceted issue because it is determined by many layers of uh, determinants that are situated within the different spheres. Remember the rainbow model with the micro, meso and macro factors. Obviously you've got the biological determinants, you've got age, sex and socio-cognitive development. You've got the behavior of people, the behavior that is more often than not linked to environmental triggers, to socio-cultural triggers, to socio-economic factors, to living in poverty, to having faced violence within their own youth, to social exclusion and inequality, which is obviously um, rife in South Africa. So all these different determinants they require a multifaceted approach towards tackling an issue as broad as violence. And that is why an integrated approach is necessary. And that can be achieved by applying a health and all policies approach, or more in particular, again, an intersectoral collabor collaborative governance approach. And that was done, or was envisaged to be done by the, mostly by the Department of Health, of course, in collaboration with the Department of Social Development and Criminal Justice. Why? Well, on the one hand, you will want to take away the triggers for violent conflicts. Uh, if you remember, and as um, Maurice will probably point out in the next presentation, under the alcohol ban, it was last year, when the lockdown there was a, a reduced rate of hospitalizations, there was a much lower rate of crime initially and, and violence related to incidents. So what one can do in order to curb the, <clears throat> the threat of, of violence or the size of violence in the country is obviously to reduce the availability and in order to hamper the, the, the use and abuse of alcohol. It is also about uh, developing safe and stable environments, creating those safe spaces in which kids can flourish. How to teach parents skills, life skills, education. There's a lot of ignorance, lots of people that are struggling with how to best raise their kids. And it is also about teaching life skills in children. So we've seen the early childhood development approach. We've got the first 1,000 days approach, uh, which is high on the, the agenda of the Western Cape government. And then the most difficult part is obviously how to change cultural and social norms to reduce intimate partner violence, the scourge of uh, gender-based violence, how to tackle this, because that is clearly a structural phenomenon. Well, if you want to implement a strategy like that, that obviously requires an optimal cooperation between all role players into the different sectors. And here in specific, that was between these three departments. Now then, along comes COVID-19. What does this mean for health and all policies? Well, one can say it's a disaster, and one can say it's a window of opportunity. A window of opportunity. Why? 
Well, COVID-19, for one, has dramatically emphasized the need for integrated ways of working because the ramifications and measures needed to, to limit its spreads in terms of risk mitigation and disaster response have had an impact far beyond the health sector. Of course, we all think about the, the, the food relief schemes, about the finance that erupted in case of 10 some time ago, about the, the widening inequality gap in South Africa during COVID-19, the high rates of unemployment. Hence, the effects of COVID-19 and responses have deepened those existing social inequalities and put them in the spotlight. In the Western Cape, now, the pandemic has created a new urgency to address these interlinked problems of inequality, poverty, unemployment, and violence. So they were already existing before, as we all know, but they have been given a higher platform, so to speak, and informed the provincial recovery plan, which I will touch on in a minute. So how has intersectoral collaboration played out in the Western Cape during COVID-19? Well, probably the most well-known and popular strategy was the so-called hotspot strategy, which is building on the joint district and metro approach, uh, which is a shared model of collaborative governance, aligned with another model of collaborative governance that was already in the pipeline before COVID-19, the district development model, but also informed, of course, by the disaster risk management framework as mandated by the Disaster Risk Act of 2002. And what the Western Cape did is they focused largely on how best to manage the response to the epidemic, because it's difficult to touch on the vulnerability or the exposure, but it's easier to work on how best to manage. How can we keep, keep tabs on what is happening? And that was basically along seven thematic areas, as you can see in the slides. So the one was around case management, about how to follow-up cases to contact tracing. One was around quarantine and isolation, civil compliance, slowing the spreads, the humanitarian relief and economic recovery. All of this, as you can imagine, entails the collaboration between different government departments, quite a number of different departments as we, as we speak. And one of the most important um, links that tied it all together was increased and improved communication. Communication is pivotal to all of this work. What, I have, what have you learned from the hotspot strategy? Well, a rapid assessment done by the data uh, uh, center sitting at the, the office of the Premier has shown that actually hotspots that were established in areas where there were pre-existing initiatives in terms of shared governance or working across sectors, working um, interaction between public and private sectors and civil society, that already proved to be a foundation. So that somehow set the tone and made it easier or provided some sort of a template to take it from there. Obviously, the, the, the sense of urgency under COVID uh, was a main driver. People felt really urged to, uh, to start working together. It was easier to across those sectoral barriers. There's also a very strong value given to the importance of a very of strong and collective leadership in those hotspots led by municipal or sometimes district managers, uh, all dependent or a lot dependent on the quality of the leadership. And that is a typical asset that we talk about in health promotion as well. Leadership, shared vision, and then thirdly, the local buy-in or the community engagement is also very important. Another aspect that was also highlighted in this rapid assessment was the, the, the benefits of sharing information and communicating. So not sitting on your own data, but making it clear to everyone where we are in terms of these the new numbers of cases, these are the current hotspots. So to, to be able to get that bird's eye view of the situation and to zoom in on the places and spaces where the interventions are mostly needed. So the importance of data and sharing data has been pivotal, but also the possibilities for co-learning. So not using a top-down um, hierarchical uh, approach from within confined governmental mandates uh, across the different tiers of government, but to, to use 
a sort of a horizontal platform that obviously requires different skill sets. Again, it's listening, it's uh, active listening to other people, it's taking a humble position and allow co-learning to happen to organically flourish if you want. Still, there was challenges as well as we go forward. So government structures still remain quite siloed and fragmented. And people, often for policymakers, it is difficult to find that middle, the, the fine line between letting innovation and creation happen, new initiatives be born, versus staying within, within their own regulatory government mandates. So sometimes it can be a bit conflicting. Then how to maintain those effective uh, communication channels and how best to align your membership Obviously, in a hotspot where there was no buy-in from the civil society, it would be very difficult to get local buy-in and then to, to make initiatives happen. Leadership was, of course, variable, and then the risk of fatigue of several waves of COVID-19. But overall, lessons from the hotspot strategy point to the importance of context. And that is something from within a policy sphere that has been highlighted now several times. It is very important when implementing interventions something that we know from within the health promotion to pay attention to, to the context. You cannot just implement the one size fits all. You have to go down to a narrow granular level of you know, space and space-based initiatives of local place-based initiatives, as one would say. We also need to pay attention when working across sectors. For example, now working with the South African Police Service to enforce lockdown regulations, for example, how far do you go? We all know the discourses, the debates, uh, the pros and cons versus encouraging people, encouraging people to change the behavior, to wear the masks, sanitize and keep the distance, which is not always possible, especially in the crowded townships. There is a clear need to delineate roles and responsibilities. It is always easier for people to work within what they are uh, perceiving as, as being their role rather than leave it completely open. So there is some need for clarity there. The importance of community engagement cannot be dismissed because when you cannot engage your community, you're never going to be able to implement an intervention in that community. Evidence and data, as we all know, under COVID has been highlighted by the very productive team at the Western Cape who has published the COVID-19 dashboards and has literally provided like real-time uh, updates on the situation. And that has made things easier to follow. And then finally, what one would say is the whole of government approach seems easier to achieve than a whole of sector approach, meaning that the whole of government approach is working across sectors within governance, whilst the whole of society approach entails collaborating with other stakeholders outside of government, civil society, private sector, for obvious reasons, because policymakers have more, maybe more similar skill sets or operate within the same um, domain. So those are some of the lessons that we learned from uh, the hotspot strategy. Then I'm going to briefly introduce you to work done by Helen Schneiders with the uh, others, Leslie London and uh, Gavin Reagan and people at the Western Cape government who have done another study on intersectoral collaboration and looked at the, the impact of, or rather the engagement of the health, with the non-health sectors at government level. They have also examined the rural joint operations committees and looked at how this will now, how this has influenced the Western Cape recovery plan. So Helen has clearly uh, allow me to use some of our slides. This is talking about the methods and what we are looking at. So number one, engaging non-health government departments. Obviously under COVID-19, everything revolves around the Department of Health. It is and should be the champion of, of leading efforts and initiatives in this respect, because COVID is a health-related concern. So how do you have a wider response? Well, fortunately, there was like um, the potential or the possibility of, of establishing links between several sectors that grew almost organically 
mostly at first between the Department of Health and the Department of Economic Development and Tourism. For obvious reasons, the large impact on the formal and informal sector and business in general in Cape Town, how COVID would impact and the lockdown regulations mostly would impact now on the uh, employment opportunities and the already high unemployment rates and what to do about this, how to mitigate. So under the Disaster Management Act, everything is about mitigating the risk and then responding to the crisis. So there was a, a number of engagements that went on with a range of national and provincial sectors. Over the first four months of the first wave, both proactive and reactive. Within disaster management resilience frameworks, there is that, that focus either on being proactive or being reactive. Reactive means you respond to a crisis, whilst proactive you put systems and measures in place to anticipate. For example, the creation of the intermediate care hospitals or other measures that were meant to proactively look at what might be happening and to anticipate the unintended consequences. Sectors that were closely aligned now are started to collaborate or also collaborate with the Department of Health, included, for example, SAPS, for obvious reasons, reinforcement and enforcement of lockdown regulations, Department of Correctional Services, Department of Education, Economic Development and Tourism, and also very importantly, the Department of Community Safety, because they were, uh, even within their national mandate, um, allowed to broker. And they had a brokering role with national law enforcement agencies. Most importantly, SAPS. So as you can see in this column, this is a preliminary data, has not been published yet, but these, these are the findings that was based on the work that Helen undertook. It revolves around sharing information about practical assistance, technical and logistical assistance from the Department of Health to other sectors, assisting with data management, sharing the information, and establishing a, um, a frequently asked questions forum. <clears throat> now, the impact, what has the impact been? The main achievements of this reaching out across boundaries, this intersectoral governance has been the fact that responses have been mainstreamed over time and that the Department of Health became a trusted partner for other sectors so that people in other sectors also started to develop in-house capacity. There has been an increased focus also on the importance of occupational health and safety, which is what traditionally used to be somewhat a neglected sort of area. And that also entailed relationships with environmental health practitioners. A lot has been gained in terms of working across disciplines and sectors, both horizontally and vertically. Sometimes there have been overreactions uh, in terms of businesses shutting down, for example, for, uh, for fear of uh, exaggerated fear of uh, continuing numbers of infection, for example. There have been testing constraints as initially there was like a contact tracing with the high risk vulnerable who were being traced um, and then invited for uh, testing, for example, but that appeared to be unmanageable uh, in time. So there has been a lot of learning that went on um, and that ultimately led to an adaptive sort of governance, what is called adaptive governance in, uh, in policymakers terms, whereby meetings somehow decreased in frequency, but the momentum was still there. So lessons from this approach basically include the fact that, you know, everything revolves around communicating. Early communication, delivering training materials, health education, tailored to the specific needs of communities and target groups, building their capacity rather than making or keeping people and other, uh, uh, other groups dependent on government response. So it's sort of instituting a more horizontal platform for decision making. Feeding into that a lot of data around infection levels, hotspots, trends, and so forth. And then very importantly, again, the style of engagement, open-ended listening. And this is something that is not, does not come natural to many people. It is something that has to be learned. So it's taking that sort of, that stance of that sort of position whereby you put yourself on an equal footing with 
people from other sectors and stakeholders, when you talk to civil society and the private sector, not being prescriptive, but allowing, providing the space for negotiation and for co-creating knowledge. In other words, for uh, letting the uh, new initiatives be uh, originating in, in, a, in the most natural way. Very importantly, also the involvement of senior players was very important it's because it's perceived as as um, as a pull factor. Uh, people like the fact that senior government officials are present in meetings at local municipal level in in the in the rural uh, committee meetings and in the hotspots. So it is important that there is quality of leadership at all levels. When we look at those joint operation centers, for example, uh, this is something that Helen uh, assessed in the, in the rural areas, also mandated by the Disaster Management Act, combining local and district municipalities, being led by a district or sometimes municipal manager, so cutting across the different tiers of governance. And obviously they were meant to, to put in place or implement the directives and regulations as mandated, through the central commands of the disaster management framework. They were looking into providing humanitarian response, most often food relief, uh, sometimes other assistance. Also enforcing regulations, sharing information and coordination, especially with regard to quarantine and isolation that required quite some intersectoral collaboration. As we all know, there was a famous system of the uh, the red and blue dot taxis that was put in place. There was the, uh, the, the cooperation with the Department of uh, um, Transport. So there was a lot of negotiation between different sectors that was needed to set in place and in motion the whole system of risk mitigation strategies under COVID-19. Upon evaluating the, the effectiveness of the joint operation committees in the rural areas again Helen found that while well, success factors included having that common goal again the shared vision of health promotion it's nothing new for people who work in health promotion the quality of leadership and commitment how do you get to that commitment also the continuity and the alignment of membership it was Constraining, on the other hand, could obviously be the lesser commitment. Sometimes there was lesser leadership in some of the, the for example, also the hotspots and the joint operating uh, operation centers. There was less leadership or there was non-attendance from certain groups. So there would be tensions maybe between local and district municipalities, although mostly there was like that was found to be positive. The relationship or engagement or interaction, if you want, between local, district, provincial, and national, on the other hand, was less favored at times. So there was a, a bigger gap between national and, 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 and local than, for example, between local and district, which comes as no surprise. Sometimes some of these operation centers also acted in a, in a, in a rather information-heavy way, rather than action-oriented, and that then was left rudderless. So there was nothing that happened uh, in terms of concrete action on the ground. And of course, you always have the problems of uh, mandates, conflicts, of conflicting mandates and, and questions around decision-making powers. So all this resulted in a number of lessons that I can share with you around the alignment of roles and functions and decision-making powers. Again, from a policy perspective, authorization. So it's around can, for example, the deputy director communicate directly with his counterparts at another tier of governments? So that would facilitate the communication and the interaction between district and sub-district levels. And then how can you transform crisis management into one of development? And that is one that was obviously being questioned uh, in, the, in the revisiting of the Western Cape provincial plan that had already been developed prior to COVID, but now was somehow tweaked based on lessons learned under COVID and was named now the provincial recovery plan in the next stage of the disaster response in the cycle. The Western Cape, who has now basically focused around three main areas. It's all about 
jobs. It's about well-being and about safety. And they're all, they are all linked, of course, to the, to the high levels of inequality, the poverty, unemployment, and still high rates of malnutrition that are found in the Western Cape and South Africa overall for that matter. But so let's focus on the, the, the safety aspect. When you look at that, how to build safe and cohesive communities, think back to the, the provincial integrated violence prevention projects. Well, here, what is written out now in the, in the recovery plan is basically to enhance, on the one hand, it's looking at reinforcing policies. So enhancing capacity and effectiveness of policing and law enforcement, so that is on the one hand, but on the other hand, you also have to, of course, offer the enabling initiative, the alternative, and that is by increasing the safety of public spaces, spaces to increase special planning and infrastructure. So creating those safe and secure areas, uh, spaces for people where they, they're not afraid to be caught in a, in a crossfire. And it is about reducing exposure and experience of violence by children and their caregivers, how to do that. And that basically revolves around four different factors. Just to give you the background backdrop to this, this is about the theory of change that underlies the safe priority target. The four thematic areas includes, well, on the one hand, you've got the interpersonal violence that is linked to, well, violence prevention and law enforcement initiatives. Again, in turn, being informed by new approaches towards surveillance, for example, and informed by data. So the large amounts of data that have been made available and the importance of big data, if you want, and real-time data under COVID-19 could be used now to improve the law enforcement going forward post-COVID. If you talk about the hotspot strategy, well, you could as easily map hotspots in terms of crime and crime prevention. So that is one area that can be taken uh, into consideration. The other one is the, the, the space-based or the locality-based implementation initiatives. Again, in line with the hotspots, geographic areas, where to target your intervention, where it has the greatest benefits. And finally, everything is based, of course, on the best available evidence, both international and local. So those principles, are held high in the, in the recovery plan. Implications for advancing intersectoral collaboration overall going forward. Again, well, what we see is that the shared crisis of COVID-19 can be seen as a catalyst, as a window of opportunity, and in which several inclusive governance mechanisms have been put in place. Examples of good collaborative governance based on trust, building relationships of trust, using a values-based versus a command and control approach and clear mandates with, need, with the need for sometimes more clear delineation of uh, roles and responsibilities. Bearing in mind also the tensions between formal and informal planning, letting emergence happen as part of a complexity-based scenario, and that will require, as, as I heard often, a shift in mindset from disaster from a disaster-based philosophy to a developmental philosophy, from thinking about containment, mitigation, responsiveness, towards building resilience and enabling assets of potential towards creating that, that potential for growth in the post-COVID era. So in a nutshell, intersectoral collaboration under COVID-19 in the Western Cape has been built and has been shown to be feasible and doable based on relationships of trust, on shared governance structures and common data systems that can be leveraged for future intersectoral collaboration. There is a need for a shift from disaster management to developmental mindsets. And we need to be aware of current governmental planning and accountability frameworks. You always need to be aware of you know, the existing silos and how to tackle the issue of fragmented services. Obviously, there is a role for the health sector as a universal recipients, one could call, of, one, one could say, of failing societies, because they have to deal with the wicked problems of poverty, inequality. It will always show up on their doorstep. So the health sector has a championing, a championing role here uh, that can be 
used to overcome those governance challenges. And under COVID, it has been taken on as and accepted as natural by other governmental departments. So that is something that might play in our advantage going forward. So to wrap up this presentation, I just wanted to, to share with you the fact that intersectoral engagement, it's not an, an ideal or utopic sort of, uh, it's not impossible. It is possible, as has been shown under, Western, under COVID in the Western Cape, because, of course, of the urgency of the situation. Um, there is like a, a window of opportunity here to push this agenda forward. For doing so, we need a soft skill set, skill set that is germane to, to, to health promotion, to health promotion practitioners. We need to be able to, to listen, to discuss, and to create spaces for negotiation and for co-creation. Since we know that health promotion is central to the SDG agenda, intersectoral action and health and all policies, being part of health promotion are clearly set to help achieve that goal. And that is what I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. That was uh, a very interesting presentation. Uh, we can now take uh, questions, but uh, before you ask questions, can I make two announcements? There is a, we created a, a Mentimeter, just two questions to ask you, and, and, and we will appreciate if you can uh, uh, just uh, send us the responses. Uh, it's an open-ended question, uh, and you can just type your response and uh, we'll share during the discussion. And also for those of you who will be leaving after this session, please note that we we this 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 webinar is uh, also for CPD points. If you can send us an email, uh, we will uh, also look into the register, and uh, we will um, conduct you to talk to you about uh, the CPD points because we need your HPCSA number. Thank you. So you can uh, unmute and, and, and ask questions to Peter before he goes out for load shedding. Anyone with questions? You unmuted. Oh, I just said it must have been a clear presentation. <laughs> I have one question for you, Peter. Maybe oh. you can, uh, uh, you, your presentation was more on the Western Cape uh, province. Uh, maybe if you can just give us a, a, summa, a summary of how uh, South Africa or SADC or Africa or the globe has performed in terms of uh, health in all policies. In your own assessment, you don't need to give us any empirical evidence, but do you think uh, we, we are responding to COVID-19 and uh, uh, implementing the health in all policies? Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Anam. Well, in South Africa, as far as I can tell, there has been, if, ever since the start of the pandemic, there has been this, ID or maybe initiatives that happen, and of course, intersectoral collaboration as part of the National Command Council um, for COVID-19 uh, that has created platforms and initiatives that could be considered that are intersectoral and could be considered as health in all policy initiatives, um, as we would name it in, uh, in health promotion. Maybe it hasn't been done as such, but, but again, it has created that possibility of using that as, as a leverage for, for putting it higher on the agenda. There has been a long-standing um, attempt to put health and all policies on the, on the radar or higher on the political agenda, um, especially in view of, for example, from, from within our own backgrounds, dealing in the, in the health sector. We're dealing with rising burden of diabetes and hypertension, for example. We're dealing with an enormous, um, with the increasing burden of NCDs. How can you tackle that? Well, obviously not from within the health sector because it's linked to so many 
social and environmental determinants. So you need an intersectoral approach. You need health and all policies. And this is something that we have been advocating for for a long time uh, through the Health Promotion Development Foundation, for example, to put in place that sort of horizontal platform, uh, which based on examples from other countries, mostly in the Southeast Asia, in Thailand or Victoria and in, in Australia, for example, at, a, at, a, at an interministerial level, but at the level of the premier or the cabinets of the, the highest office, basically, to, to give the mandates to to that office to uh, to execute its its powers, if you want to to make it happen, uh, and that is something that is still that we're still waiting for. It is not clear where it should be positioned, and it has been talks about uh, being seen in view of the, the the national health insurance as something that is inevitable that needs to be brought to light. But whether it should be in government or out, outside of government, as an independent health promotion foundation, for example, uh, that is still. Um, um, it is not easy, obviously, because it's linked to health, but it, cross, it cuts across sectors. So it is quite often that this long learn a steep. I think Peter is gone. I suspect that there's load shedding and there's an interruption with the internet. Uh, any questions, colleagues, maybe we can discuss among ourselves whilst we're waiting for him to reconnect. Uh, otherwise, if there's no question, then I will ask uh, Yuris to take us through the next topic. Uh, sorry, Peter, about that. Okay. Over to you, Yuris. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, I, um, <clears throat> I was a really interesting uh, uh, input by Peter, actually, and some of it actually talks to some of the work that we have been doing. I think you will see an overlap uh, in some of the issues that we are, um, uh, that I will be talking about. Um, so I think it's, uh, the, the, the alignment between the two presentations is quite important. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry. I think I allowed oh, you to share screen. Yes, here yes, we go. yes. Got it? Okay. It's coming. It's coming. I like your background. It <laughs> Oh yes, thank you. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, very much a part of what we're doing at the moment. There we go. Great. Can you see the screen? All right. Yes. Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. Thanks very much, um, uh, everybody. So basically, um, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the advocacy work we've done in the time of COVID, but also actually talking about what we've learned from COVID, actually about um, uh, uh, about alcohol in South Africa. So first of all, just to tell you who SAPA is, we're a, a non-profit organization registered with DSD and the CRPC, non-profit, non-partisan, secular public health advocacy organization working for legislative change towards the permanent reduction in alcohol-related harm. We are not prohibitionists. It's very important. You know, a lot of people think that because you speak out against alcohol harm, that therefore you're speaking out against alcohol. We are not prohibitionist. We are not anti-freedom of choice. We are not coming at the issue from a moralistic perspective, but from a public, public health perspective. Um, so SAPA recognizes the right of the alcohol industry to exist and to conduct business. Um, uh, equally though, we recognize the right of individuals to choose whether to drink or not and how to drink if they do. And that means that um, given the fact that the liquor industries primary function is to make profit, um, they have to be controlled because otherwise they actually, ride, they actually ride roughshod over the right of individuals to choose whether to drink or not and how to drink if they do. 
The World Health Organization Global Strategy to Reduce the Harmful Use of Alcohol advocates the adoption of three best buys, which is reducing the availability of alcohol, increasing the price of alcohol, and limiting or banning alcohol advertising and sponsorships. And this is the basis of the advocacy work that SAPA SA does. Now, just to quickly give you some in, uh, introduction to the regulatory environment in which we find ourselves around alcohol. First of all, very, very importantly, is the constitution of 1996. And there are two critical issues related to that. One is that the constitution promotes public participation. It encourages uh, the public's involvement in matters of governance. It says it so explicitly. And there's legislation as well, uh, particularly the municipal legislation, which talks about even uh, uses the, the notion of democratic participation or participatory democracy. So there's very much this idea that the public should have a say in uh, uh, what is happening in the country, particularly on matters that affect them directly. And that is quite a critical issue in terms of alcohol, as I will point out. Um, the other issue, though, that the Constitution does is it raises challenges with the mandate over alcohol control. I'll talk a bit more to that later, but briefly, it, the, the Constitution uh, gives certain powers to national and certain powers to provinces and certain powers to local government. And in fact, there, there are challenges around alignment between these three, resulting in confusion, uh, resulting in creating space for the, particularly the liquor industry to take advantage of that confusion. Um, 1999, government adopted groundbreaking tobacco legislation. And I mentioned that because it's a very important marker in terms of alcohol, um, because what the tobacco legislation did most importantly was it shifted the balance of power between smokers and non-smokers. Uh, prior to 1999 and, 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 and a little bit before that, when they began to introduce new tobacco legislation, non-smokers uh, were actually at the mercy of smokers um, because wherever you went, people were smoking. If you went into meetings, into public gatherings, public spaces, people were smoking and there was very little anyone could do to change that. And the most important thing in, in, in our view that that legislation did was it shifted that balance of power. Um, and uh, so today we have a situation where to smokers actually uh, uh, are on the back foot. They are the ones who have to ask permission to smoke. They are the ones who have to leave the room if they want to smoke. Um, and that's very, very important in terms of conceiving of what an alcohol safe South Africa could look like, because it's the same thing that's needed is to change the balance of power between the, particularly those traders and consumers of alcohol who behave in a way that is actually antisocial, that is uh, damaging to um, the, the, the well being of, of, of people around them. Um, so 2003, first national post-apartheid alcohol legislation. Um, 2003 onwards, some provinces passed their own alcohol laws. Um, 2010, there was a quite an important development. The, inter the cabinet appointed an interministerial committee on substance abuse led by the Department of Social Development, which aligned government policy approach with the World Health Organization best buys that I mentioned in the previous slide. That is to say the uh, uh, reducing availability of alcohol, increasing the price of alcohol and limiting or banning alcohol advertising. Um, and at the same time, a very important development happened that cabinet adopted a policy that government shouldn't collaborate with the, with the alcohol industry because they said it would, it would impact on government's ability to carry out its legislative responsibilities. Um, because otherwise the, 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 the liquor industry then has too much of an influence over government, uh, particularly if they offer money to support government programs, which they do and which uh, um, uh, uh, disempowers government then in terms of, 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 of passing proper legislation. 
Um, 2013, again, in line with the, uh, the WHO best buys, the control of marketing of alcohol beverages bill was approved by cabinet, but it was never released for public comment. And that's largely because there was incredible resistance from the liquor industry, from the media industry, from the advertising industry, from the sporting community. Um, and, and this this kind of uh, opposition uh, existed within cabinet as well, though it was denied, but it existed within cabinet as well. Uh, and this was attested to last year by the Minister of uh, of, of Transport, Vigila Mbalula, who said that when he was, uh, that he currently supports the idea of banning alcohol advertising as Minister of Transport. But he admitted uh, that quite candidly, that when he was Minister of Sport back in 2013, he opposed the control of marketing of alcohol beverages bill. And that's actually a problem because it means we don't have a whole of government approach to dealing with the issue of alcohol. And I think that um, part of what Peter was talking about alludes to that as well. You need a whole of government approach to dealing with critical issues like uh, alcohol. Um, so in 2016, there was a new national policy adopted by government. They assessed the 2003 legislation, adopted a new policy based on the World Health Organization best buys. And the liquor amendment bill was also approved by cabinet and released for public comment and went through a public participation process. Unfortunately, since then, both the elections of 2017 and 2019 uh, resulted in a hold being put on, on the bill. And then since the appointment of the new minister of DTRC, there's absolutely no interest in the bill from the DTRC. And in fact, we, we, we get a very real sense from uh, interaction that we have with other departments that the DT, DTRC is looking around for alternative ways of dealing with alcohol and not proceeding with new legislation. So it's a big problem um, that we that, that 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 is posing a challenge to to us and to anybody else who's trying to uh, ensure that alcohol harm is reduced. Um, so the basis of our work is that we, we promote the who best buys. We lobby for the adopt, adoption of the legislation, particularly the liquor amendment bill, and if possible, the control of marketing the alcohol beverages bill, because that would have completely banned all alcohol advertising and sponsorships um, uh, by the, you know, in the sporting community and so on. The Liquor Amendment Bill does introduce some restrictions on, on marketing of alcohol, but it doesn't go as far as the control bill. We're also pushing for increased alcohol taxes and the establishment of a health promotion development fund to fund the alcohol harm reduction efforts of uh, government and civil society, similar to what they're doing in Thailand, for example. Building a social movement of civil society organizations in support of an alcohol safe South Africa. And we have an alliance partner approach, which I'll talk to a bit later as well. And then most importantly, encouraging the empowerment of citizens to have a decisive influence over alcohol policy decisions and over when, where, and how alcohol is sold in their own neighborhoods. Now under COVID, um, uh, COVID was an interesting, opportunity for us because it was a natural experiment in which uh, a government decided to ban alcohol against international trends. I think there were only about 10 countries in the world that actually completely banned alcohol for a period of time. And South Africa is certainly the only country that did it four times. Um, and most other countries banned on consumption alcohol for a while. So bars, pubs, restaurants, and so on, weren't able to sell alcohol. Um, but off consumption was allowed. And there's an interesting uh, uh, graph I want to talk to just now, which shows why they did that and why our government has, has swayed between banning alcohol altogether and then restricting off consumption, but not on consumption, which doesn't really make any sense. Um, so that was the, the major response was to do that. Um, there was a reduction in trauma cases across the country, uh, lifting, as uh, as one doctor said from Kurdiskia, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, lifting the unmistakable combination smell of blood and alcohol that people in trauma units experience. 
So they, they were free of that for two months, but it came back with a vengeance after the, 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 the uh, lifting of the ban. There was definitely a reduction in the levels of unnatural deaths. And uh, uh, Peter talked to the issue of crime. Most um, uh, some statistics came out yesterday, actually, indicating that in the period April to June last year, uh, uh, this year, compared to June last year, uh, which is the you know April to to the beginning of June was when the first ban was in place. That. Uh, murders increased by 66%, sexual offenses by 74%, vehicle hijackings over 90%, robberies at, uh, uh, at, at premises over 40%, cash and transit by 142%. Now, those the drops would have been a result uh, because of the curfew, but as well, some of them would have been influenced by the drop uh, by the unavailability of alcohol incredibly significant figures um, and points to the need for something to be done to change what we might call normal uh, 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 in, in pre-COVID times and to avoid that normality continue to exist in post-COVID times. So just a quick couple of graphs to show this. This was, I think, from, from the Western Cape where they showed, uh, uh, you know, that um, uh, uh, the... 60, you know, they, they expected a rise of 62% of uh, violence cases. If off consumption sales from, uh, came back, 20 30% increase in traffic events and so on. Uh, in um, uh, This was in George Hospital. You can see a dramatic drop in April. This was February, March and April of 2020. Dramatic drop in all of these three categories, uh, all, 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 all uh, four categories actually. Assaults, tra road traffic incidents, injuries, sexual assaults. Um, um, this was uh, in Worcester. Again, you can see there was no ban in 1st of January to March, a huge drop, increased again, another ban dropped again, and so on. And then finally, this is the unnatural deaths, uh, um, which occurred from 29th December to uh, April 2021 by Moultrie and others. And you can see, uh, you, you all be aware of this, this normal graph that the MRC does where the dotted line indicates what the expected natu unnatural deaths will be. And then the, the small dotted lines is the, 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 the variation, the expected variations. The, the solid line is the actual unnatural deaths. And you can see a dramatic drop over here in the first ban. In interestingly, in this uh, under number three here is when there was a ban on um, um, uh, no, actually there wasn't, just a second, uh, offsite restricted. Yeah, sorry, number four uh, is when on consumption was banned, but off consumption was allowed. And you will see there's a definite drop uh, over here. Uh, whereas all the other cases where on consumption was allowed and off consumption was not allowed or, or was restricted, there was no real difference, no real change to the unnatural deaths. And that's an indication that on consumption is a much greater problem than off consumption because particularly under, for COVID, because it's with on consumption that you will find uh, um, the spread of the virus uh, because of uh, a lack of social distancing, because once people have had a few drinks, they forget about the COVID uh, protocols, but also it's in those spaces that um, uh, interpersonal violence is more likely to happen. So our work at that time was mainly writing articles in the media, issuing press statements with every change in alcohol re regulations, um, a whole spate of interviews on radio and TV, using of social media to get messaging out, lots of submissions to the presidency and the, and the NCCC, joint submissions with Charles Parry and others from the uh, SAMRC, et cetera, submissions to NEDLAC and engagements with a range of stakeholders, our alliance partners, the Communist Party, Kasatu, portfolio committees, public health researchers and practitioners and so on. All of which was trying to engage with people to say, 
uh, as people were, were saying themselves, there's clearly a problem we have with alcohol in the country. COVID has shown it. What are we going to do about it? How are we going to actually deal with it now? But more importantly, what are we going to do after COVID? Um, what it actually did, what COVID did, was it helped to put uh, SAPA SA on the national agenda, which obviously was, was good for us. Um, it contributed to the general debate around alcohol and the challenges we face as a country. It highlighted the fact that problems existed before COVID and will continue during and after COVID if ro robust steps aren't taken by government to correct the situation. We do know that government noted our interventions. For example, when government was responding um, to a court challenge by SA breweries around the bans, they cited uh, our, our submissions. But there's very little evidence that they acted on our suggestions or indeed those of the South African Medical Research Council were making their decisions at the NCCC. Um, we were acknowledged by the SACP and Kasat who, who called on us and asked for, offered their support, but also asked for our interventions um, because they are concerned. Both of them, I think, are concerned about the fact that the legislation is not going through either. Um, and there was a lot more support from within civil society. Now, we actually work on the basis that alcohol uh, is a national issue. It's not an issue that is specific to a particular sector of people. It's not even only a public health issue. And so if you look at our alliance partners, and we've got 26 alliance partners, you will see that they cover a wide range of uh, disciplines of sectors in society, people, organizations dealing with children's rights, uh, health issues, gun-free South Africa and violence, um, uh, rate payers and residents associations, health forum in Kailicha, National Council Against Smoking, um, people opposed to women abuse, people's health movement, rural doctors association, save the children, et cetera, et cetera. Songke gender justice, Seoul city, South Africans against drunk driving, et cetera. So the, the, the point is that there are very few organizations in South Africa actually that deal with alcohol directly. Um, but if you talk to organizations, all of them say that alcohol impacts on the work that they're trying to do. For example, in education, there are problems around the proximity of alcohol outlets to schools. There, there's the problem of uh, 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 teachers coming to school drunk or drinking at school. There's a problem of kids coming to school drunk or drinking at school. Um, there are the problems of advertising and proximity to schools. All of these issues have an impact on the functioning of schools, on uh, the education process and so on. But, that organ but all those organizations don't have the capacity to, to deal directly with the alcohol issue. So therefore, SAPA is seen as a way of assisting them to focus attention on the issue and for them to get support for their efforts to deal with this. And so our aim is to expand the, the range of organizations across the country that are part of, uh, uh, that are part of our alliance partners to build actually what we, you know, what we call a social movement around alcohol. So in terms of going forward, we, we have to build on the recognition by many elected officials nationally, provincially, and locally that South Africa has a problem with alcohol and that better legislation is needed. Even the president, um, who has been talking about alcohol since, since 2018 at the, at the, globe, at the, um, the, the summit on gender-based violence, has acknowledged the, role, the, the, the negative role of alcohol in society. And the beginning of this year, in the, the, the ANC's January the 8th speech, he, he, he talked to this issue. And then on the 15th of January, he was interviewed by the Sunday Times and he specifically said, we need to change the legislation. And he mentioned four areas in which that needed to happen. And that was in the age of drinking, in, in the um, operating hours of drinking, in the uh, tax on, on alcohol and on advertising. So, all of those talk to the World Health Organization best buys. Um, the strange thing though, is that nothing is happening. And that the minister, the current minister of DTRC has been completely silent on this issue since he was appointed. This is uh, Ibrahim Patel, who used to be the minister of um, economic development, but that department was, uh, was joined up with uh, the department of trade and industry 
It's now called the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition. And Rob Davies uh, was not reappointed. And he was the person who was driving the liquor amendment bill. So we have a situation where the future of that legislation rests on the shoulders of the Minister of uh, Trade and Industry. We know that uh, departments in the social cluster in particular, health, uh, DSD, education, are all very, very concerned about the issue, are frustrated with the DTRC, have actually expressed their frustration in no uncertain terms in meetings with the DTRC and said that they're tired of having meetings and discussing the issue, the bill needs to be passed. And yet somehow it's just not happening. Somehow, um, even though the president argued for new legislation, even though there is this, there, there is this move from within cabinet for it to happen, there somehow isn't any pressure being put on the DTRC to do anything about it, um, which is a challenge obviously that we have to confront um, and that we have to find a way to, to see if we can change that situation. Um, we have to accept that SARPA's influence over COVID-19 decisions is limited. As I pointed out, uh, the, the, the evidence of the study that was done by Moultrie showed that, the, that apart from the ban, the most effective way of reducing alcohol-related harm was to restrict on consumption uh, sales of alcohol. And yet government has continually, despite the fact that we've pointed this out to them a number of times, they've continually resorted to uh, only restricting off consumption. And so we've just decided, you know, that, that actually COVID as a COVID in terms of government's responses to COVID in many ways have become a sideshow for us. Um, and that we've got to focus on the, on the, 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 the the, 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 the efforts to get government to focus on the liquor amendment bill and to get, to get new legislation in place um, now if possible, but certainly as soon as possible after COVID. And one of the things we're going to do is use a particular issue which you may be aware of, is that uh, petrol stations have begun to apply for liquor licenses. And uh, the, 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 the National Liquor Policy of 2016 recommends that such licenses are not granted. The Liquor Amendment Bill that we are trying to get passed specifically forbids uh, the, the awarding of such licenses. But because the bill hasn't been passed, it's of no effect. And of course, with the policy, as we all know, the policy is of no, it has no force. It has no... Uh, uh, legal uh, uh, status, you have to turn it into legislation. And uh, so despite the fact that it's in the policy, despite the fact that it's the intention is in the liquor amendment bill, for as long as it's not passed into legislation, provinces are free to do what they want. Now we have discovered that the Guazulu Natal government and the Limpopo government have taken a stand on the issue and they've decided that they don't want uh, petrol stations to have liquor licenses. The Western Cape had actually decided that in the 2008 legislation, but repealed it because there was a, a technical flaw in the way in which the clause was phrased. The, the alcohol harm reduction bill does propose that at least on provincial and national roads, that petrol stations shouldn't have liquor licenses. We don't really understand why uh, local, uh, uh, why, why, they, why they're excluding local roads. And I'll talk to that uh, shortly in terms of um, what's happening at the moment with in, in Cape Town in particular, in the Western Cape in particular. But um, it, is an, it is a rallying point. It's almost like a gift that's come from BP and, and, and pick and pay because they're the ones who are driving the, the, this call for these licenses to happen. And it's a way that we can actually galvanize public support um, you know, both against actual petrol station licenses, but uh, also support for the legislation to be passed so that there's clarity that's given to provinces and everybody else around this issue. It's also a very practical way that communities can get directly involved in this, and I'll talk to that as well in a moment. 
And then the other thing we want to do is take our work to the provinces, establish extended networks and assist people at neighborhood level to disrupt the complacency of government and the alcohol industry who've become accustomed to working in a non-inclusive, opaque and unaccountable manner in relation to alcohol regulation and liquor licensing. And I go back to the constitution and the fact that the constitution not only talks about public participation, but it also talks about people's right to health, uh, well-being, safety, and so on. And yet none of those are being recognized in terms of um, uh, the, the urgent need to introduce liquor, uh, proper liquor legislation, which will create the envi an environment in which, in which such, um, uh, 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 you know, in which the, sa the health, safety, and security of, and well-being of communities can be protected. Um, the, so, so with regard to, with regard to the petrol station issue, just to show you that uh, we have been on the ground, uh, even in the midst of COVID, we've been on the ground over the last while. Uh, we've had uh, this picture over here is uh, a, a picket outside uh, the BP headquarters, um, calling on them to stop fueling the problems of alcohol in the country by having petrol station liquor licenses. Um, this was done in George by Sahara, one of our alliance partners, um, who, who actually protested against an existing petrol station license and went to the police as well, as you can see, to call for uh, better enforcement in the area. This is the petition that we left at, uh, BP, uh, at BP being signed off. And this is a banner, uh, a, um, this is a, uh, our mask that we, that we are using, our COVID mask we're using to promote this issue. In the Western Cape, three licenses were applied for recently, in uh, one in Salt River, one in Seapoint, and one in Somerset West. And so what we did was we, we galvanized people in those communities to, to object to the bills, to object to, the, to the, the applications. Now, this is a very important issue. I don't know how many people um, here, I mean, let's see, there's 11 people participating here. Um, I, uh, I wonder how many of you know that you as citizens are, have the right to object to a liquor license application. Uh, I would guess that if half of you know that, it's a lot because that's our experience, is that the bulk of people in the country are not aware of the fact that they have a legal constitutional right to object if a liquor license is applied for. And that is with good reason, because government recognizes that alcohol is a problematic product. As uh, Thomas Barbour and other researchers have said, it's no ordinary commodity. And therefore, people who live in a community where a liquor license has been applied for should have a say over that. The reality is that there's very little effort by government, particularly the liquor authorities in the different provinces, to inform people of their rights, to inform people of how they can find out if a license has been applied for, to inform people of how they can object, and to ensure through their own mechanisms that people have actually been informed. And so we have a situation where probably 80% of liquor licenses that are applied for are not objected to, which means that the liquor boards have no real basis on which to refuse those licenses. And so that's something that we see as quite a critical thing to do um, is to, is to uh, do what we call disrupting the complacency of the liquor industry and the um, uh, and, and government, because government, you know, the liquor industry obviously doesn't want objections to be made, and the liquor and 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 uh, government probably doesn't either in many ways, because it's more work for them if people object, because then they have to have a hearing and so on, and also if they don't award a license, then they lose the license fees, and um, there's quite a lot of money that comes to provincial governments for that. So it's very important that we continue to build a social movement of civil society organizations advocating for effective alcohol control. 
uh, focus on uh, specific sexual issues such as the link between alcohol and gender-based violence, as I mentioned before, to strengthen the call for more uh, legislation, work with researchers to make sure we've got appropriate evidence-based data because the liquor industry loves to argue that we have no data to support our arguments, uh, not that they have data to support their arguments either, to strengthen our regional, continental and global alliance policy alliances and to work with international partners to strengthen the global movement for alcohol safe societies and to contribute to global world processes like the, the World Health Organization uh, World Health Organization review of their current uh, global policy, pursuance of SDG goals, many of which are impacted on by uh, alcohol harm, support for a framework convention on alcohol control similar to the tobacco framework, the FCTC, um, to, uh, um, <clears throat> yeah, policy, uh, policy oh, sorry, yeah, policy advocates, uh, the, actually I left out, oh yeah, this is the one about, yes, uh, okay, I mentioned the complacency. So it's very important that we find a way to get people more involved at community level because if we are able to get people to object, if we are able to get people to, 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 to disrupt the system uh, that currently just trundles along at its own pace, we will actually force government to confront the reality that communities are, are not happy about the fact that they have no power. In fact, one of the things that happens when we go into communities and talk to them, we ask two questions. We say, do you have problems with alcohol in your community? And the answer is invariably yes. And then we say, is there anything you can do about it? And the answer is invariably no. And that's the thing we have to change. And that goes back to what I said about the tobacco legislation. Because if we can, we need to achieve the same uh, uh, effect through legislation that the tobacco legislation did, which was to empower ordinary citizens to be able to actually have a meaningful impact on, uh, uh, on, on, on uh, the way alcohol is used. Um, in, in, in June 2020, Richard Metopoulos already said that policy advocates and activists must not only use the current moment to highlight the, uh, um, no, sorry, must use the current moment to highlight the enduring nature of the alcohol trauma nexus um, there's much that is said about countries that can ease lockdown and get back to normal. In South Africa, returning alcohol availability to normal will return us to situations of highly hazardous use. And we have here an opportunity for stakeholders to work together to develop better alcohol policy and safeguard the post-COVID future for all South Africans. The country's response will set an important precedent for countries elsewhere confronting similar challenges. Finally, though, we, there are some major challenges we face. The one is the normalization of alcohol in society. And I'm currently writing a book for Wits, for Wits University Press on uh, the history of alcohol, particularly in South Africa, but, glo but globally as well, um, and, and its social impact. And I think it's important that we understand that alcohol has been part of the human fabric since we were still hunter gatherers. That is, you know, from, you know, as, as you know, that humans transition from hunter gathering to uh, agriculture and animal husbandry around 12,000 years ago. Before that, uh, going back hundreds of thousands of years, we were hunter gatherers. Alcohol was present. It was, a, it's a natural phenomenon. It is created through the action of yeast on sugar, and it exists in fruit, in honey, in uh, grain, and uh, humanity would have encountered it at some point um, by chance. And through that serendipitous discovery of alcohol and uh, the, the effect that it had, people eventually learned how to create it, even though for they didn't really understand the, the chemical nature of it until about the 1800s. But it has been a ubiquitous part of all societies across the world for tens of thousands of years. Unlike any other drug, 
because most other drugs, even tobacco, what's amazing about tobacco, if you think about how ubiquitous tobacco was in South Africa 20, 30 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, tobacco actually only spread through the world in about the 1600s because tobacco at that time was restricted to America, which is where it was an indigenous plant and the colonial uh, uh, invaders of America discovered tobacco, brought it back to Europe. So, uh, so tobacco has a 500 year history globally, but alcohol goes way, way back. And the same applies to uh, ganja, it applies to uh, opium, uh, mushrooms, uh, cocaine, any other kind of drug that you mentioned. Uh, does not have the same history as alcohol. So it's deeply, deeply, deeply ingrained and it's a challenge to get people to rethink it uh, and to understand the, the fact that it is a dangerous product. And, and one particular doctor asked a question one day, he said, if alcohol was discovered today for the first time, would it be approved for human consumption? And that's a very interesting question right now because everybody in the world has become aware through the vac through COVID-19 and the whole vaccine development process has become aware of the fact that getting a new medicine onto the market, getting a new product on the market, whether it's food or a drug, is not an easy process. So would alcohol be recommended for human consumption if it was discovered for the first time today? Who knows? Probably not, uh, or maybe under severe restrictions. And then, of course, the other problem is advertising, peer pressure, and the fact that all of us grow up in an environment in which there's an expectation that at some point we're going to drink alcohol. It is important to, the, to note, though, that in South Africa, only 31% of people above the age of 15 actually drink. So therefore, it's not ubiquitous across the country, but it's all the more important for us to be aware of that and to realize that for the industry, that's a big challenge because they want to increase those numbers. In Europe, uh, 60 to 70 percent of people drink and that's what the industry wants to change in South Africa they want to get 60 to 70 percent of people drinking here too so the influence of the alcohol industry is really important over government and over society as a whole um, and I pointed out before there's a lack of a whole of government approach and part of the problem is that when people consider the issue of alcohol and alcohol restrictions they talk about economic issues, they talk about uh, employment issues, they talk about a whole range of issues and use those as an excuse to not introduce legislation rather than saying, we need to introduce the legislation. How are we going to mitigate the unintended or expected consequences of that? Um, we need to change the narrative to say that the legislation is necessary and you've got to then find out a way to deal with that. One of the really important issues, uh, for example, is the fact that in the black community in particular, alcohol as it was under apartheid continues to be a, a fallback option for a lot of people, particularly under, under a period of great unemployment and economic decline. It continues to be one of the most common fallback positions for people in terms of making uh, uh, a subsistence living. And not enough is being done by government to help people to transition to doing other more socially beneficial work. Um, and, and, and so if there was a whole of government approach, then social the, the Department of Small Business Development, for example, would be brought, brought on board to find out a way that they could actually make it easier for people to do other business and not sell alcohol. Um, the economic factors are a big problem, particularly in South Africa, because we know the, the, the history of apartheid and the way it excluded black people from the economy on every level, uh, making them uh, uh, you know, servants basically to white people and uh, discouraging entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurship. And, 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 not, and not nearly enough has been done to change the generational benefits that whites have from always having been involved in the economy and the disadvantages the black community have for only getting involved in the economy in the last 30, 35 years. Um, 
There's a big problem also that the primary mandate for alcohol legislation resides with the DTRC. And one of the consequences of that is they always default to the economic. And that's understandable because that's their focus. It would be ideal actually if that mandate rested with one of the social cluster departments, either health or social development, uh, because that would ensure that social, uh, that, that public health would uh, take a front seat. Um, and then there is this major problem of the constitutional mandates for our cause split across spheres of government. Um, so you have a, a national government that has limited impact on, the, on, on, on al uh, retail alcohol sales to the public. Uh, provinces have that and they can make their own rules and they do. Um, and then you have a further complication of legislation that where, where municipalities can also make certain decisions and that creates conflict too. In the Western Cape, for example, we know that there's a situation where if the province decides to give a license to an outlet and says that your operating hours are from 10 till two in the morning, let's say, the municipality can decide to extend that to 4 a.m. Um, and so there is no alignment and that creates confusion. And uh, you, can be you, can, you can rest assured that the alcohol industry takes full advantage of that confusion to, uh, 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 to ensure that whatever happens is in their own interest. So these are major challenges that we do have, but I think that it's really important for the public health sector um, together with civil society, uh, the, you know, all the different sectors of civil society to continue to work uh, to try and find a way to uh, bring these issues uh, 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 to the fore and to ensure that uh, pressure is on government the whole time to ensure that public health considerations take priority over economic considerations and any other considerations for that matter and um, that the appropriate legislation is passed. Um, and, and, and I think it, particularly also the public health sector can play a key role in assisting in providing some of the really important data to back up the, um, the work that we and others are trying to do uh, so that we can present uh, uh, an unambiguous and unchallengeable argument uh, to, to make it clear that, um, uh, that something has to be done. Uh, and, and, and understanding that we are doing this in the context of a global reality of countries around the world fighting the same battles um, in the face of a globalized industry of about 10 major companies that are have footprints in most countries in the world and have extraordinary resources at their disposal um, to, to, to uh, influence things in their direction. Um, so we're up against a big machine, um, but I think that it is possible that we can fight it, but we have to, it has to be very, very importantly community driven, um, because that's the only way we're going to get the numbers that we, that we need in order to have the kind of impact that we want to have on government. Thanks a lot. Oh, thank you very much. That was... Uh... A very nice, uh, insightful presentation, taking us through uh, the history of uh, alcohol bills, legislation, and up to what we have done uh, in your good work. Uh, colleagues, uh, we have 10 minutes now for question, questions and answers and discussion and reflections. Uh, can you please... Uh, can you please unmute yourself and ask uh, any question or make any comment? It can be f either about this topic or you can even in the previous topic from Peter. Peter, I can see your hand. Go ahead. Yes, thanks, Maurice. That was a very interesting presentation. Uh, I, I just want to play a, a little bit devil's advocate here. Um, given that what you explained that the link of alcohol use and more importantly, probably alcohol abuse in South Africa is linked to, you know, uh, levels of intergenerational trauma, uh, structural inequalities. Uh, do you think it's uh, a doable battle or, or more of an uphill battle uh, to get this legislation in place as long as 
you know, the, the, the deeper social determinants are not, you know, addressed uh, sufficiently because it's, it's like, it's like what you said, it's uh, alcohol use and abuse, especially in disadvantaged communities is probably more of self-medication linked to, you know, the, in order to deal with the stresses of everyday life. So do you think it is, um, you still believe in, 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 in uh, getting the, in, in selling the case, but without political champions, as what you rightly mentioned, uh, will you, you have to gather your, your sufficient, you know, your um, minimum probably capacity in terms of uh, social support or community engagement, but will you will you be able to do that without sufficient support? I'm thinking about uh, we've got we you're fighting this big machine. They put in lots of uh, billions of dollars, and you know, and, and especially now in the lower and middle income countries, and trying to sell the alcohol. Same for tobacco. So you need huge measures in place in order to counter that. So um, the only proven strategy that I can think of is is, is using countermeasures like for example counter advertising uh because i'm not sure that you're going to get enough uh, civil society support to to carry the weight or to, to to fight this battle i'd like to have your opinion on on that so need for big funding i'm thinking bloomberg philanthropies or anything that can give you that sort of resource you, you can respond okay Yes. Yeah, no, look, you, you make a very good point, Peter, but I think that, um, you know, it is possible, uh, you do, uh, it, is, it is necessary to get that political backing, and it's, it's a real pity that um, political developments in South Africa uh, led to um, a, a kind of uh, hiatus uh, period after 2017. Uh, because ironically, and it's very ironic, but it was during it was during the Zuma period, and under uh, the, the 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 notorious Watabile Dlamini, uh, when she was the minister of uh, the social development, that the most progress was made around this issue. Um, we had the minister of health Mutsaledi, who introduced the control of marketing of alcohol beverages bill. We had uh, DSD leading the IMC, getting government to adopt cabinet to adopt a policy of not working with government uh, of not working with the liquor industry. We had da uh, Rob Davies, uh, uh, you know, introducing the new policy and the liquor amendment bill. Unfortunately, what happened in 2019 was with a, once the the new government was elected. Um, we had um, Patel, uh, uh, Davies replaced by Patel. We had Mkise replacing Mutsualeri. We had um, uh, uh, Batabile Dlamini replaced by uh, um, Lindiwe Zulu. And um, I can't remember the other one that was important. But uh, in each of those instances, there wasn't that history of, uh, of, of, the, of dealing with the issue. Patel, like I said, has shown no interest in the issue whatsoever, and they look like they're trying to avoid the legislation now. Um, Lindiwe Zulu has unfortunately been influenced by her deputy, uh, Henrietta Bokopani Zulu, who seems to be uh, very happy working with the liquor industry. Uh, in fact, encourages people to work with the liquor because they, they, they fund her projects. So she's very happy to take their money. And then uh, the Minister of Health and Kize, uh, he didn't show any particular interest in the issue. Uh, I'm not sure what Pasha's position is. He, I have noticed actually that in some of the budget speeches uh, uh, that Mkise has made since um, since he was appointed, that Pasha has spoken more about the alcohol issue. So we're trying to engage with him, but that's the challenge we face. But I mean, the fact is that you know you can get you can change that. Um, you can, uh, that can change over time. So uh, we, we're not unconfident about it. Um, I think given the fact that only 31% of people in the country drink uh, is, is, a, is a big plus because it means that 69% of people don't. And what do they think about the issue? Um, uh, in fact, it's only 22% of the population of the country actually. I mean, of, of, of sorry, of, of age, people age 15 and above. Because the whole population, if you include children as well, drinkers are only 22% of the country, which is a very, very low figure. Um, 
but we need that's the whole reason why we've got to actually empower people with information with knowledge about these issues because the fact is people don't know what they can do they don't know what rights they have they don't know what power potential power they do actually have to demand actually that um, alcohol is managed differently in their communities so i do think that it is possible um, the liquor industry itself is uh, i think it's always nervous about these things because if they look around the world, if you look at Russia, for example, uh, Russia since Gorbachev's time uh, has been trying to deal with the alcohol situation. Um, over the last 10 years, they've managed to reduce alcohol consumption by 43%. Now, you know, uh, Russia is one of those countries where everybody thinks about it as everybody drinking vodka, you know. Uh, they've managed to reduce consumption by 43%. That's, that's very, very significant. So these things are happening and I do think that it is possible, but it's not gonna be easy. Um, that's why I said, we've got to look at the gaps, look at the opportunities, build support, build a social movement around the issue um, so that we have a loud voice. And, and, and that loud voice must counter the voice of industry. The issue of counter advertising, interesting one, you're quite right, uh, we need to do that, but we can't afford it. I mean, you know, when I watch, I must tell you that when I watch liquor adverts, I really enjoy them because they are incredibly well made. You know, they, and you can see there's a lot of money in this guy. They've got good actors. They've, they've got good cinematography. They've got uh, good ideas, creatives and so on um, because they have the money to throw at it. Just like tobacco advertising used to be back in, uh, back in, the, in the 80s. So in the, in the liquor policy of 2016, the whole issue of counter advertising is suggested, but the question is, where do you get the money to do that? And that's why the, 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 the pursuing the idea of a health promotion development fund is really important because the, the liquor industry must be taxed um, and that the tax that comes from them must be ring fenced to be able to be used for those purposes by government and by non-government organizations. Right now, they are much happier giving their money to people that they would like to give it to because they can do that in a way that is not threatening to themselves. So it's a very important thing. And I think within the public health sector, it's very important to push for that. Um, and we, we have heard the treasury is kind of shifting in that direction. They've been, the sugar tax was interesting because it's the first time really that Treasury has kind of agreed, besides the plastic ban, which was a failure, um, uh, because all the money that came from, from the taxation from came from plastic bags was supposed to go into an environmental project, but that failed completely. And I think that is partly what has kind of influenced Treasury. But so the sugar tax, they are using that uh, uh, to an extent for health promotion. And, and so we just need to push for that uh, from, uh, yeah. from all sides. Uh, to get that, because I think then we can make uh, more of a difference. Thanks, thanks, that was good. Uh, colleagues, do we have one more pending question? Otherwise, I will ask uh, uh, Orakoke to uh, give us the, just the highlights, because we are running out of time. Any other pending questions? Uh, I don't see any in the chat. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Prof? Can you wrap up? <laughs> um, thank you, uh, and I'm, and thank you to Maurice and Peter for very interesting and thought-provoking presentations. I will just because of our time, I'll just pick up on two or three issues um, that both presentations uh, covered. Um, the issue. The first issue, um, which we have talked about a lot today, is the issue of collaboration. And um, both Peter and Maurice talked about the different uh, factors that encourages or facilitates collaboration. I would go into the details of that. But um, I think for me, the question I will raise is around how do we ensure 
better collaboration. And by that, I mean, what questions, what more questions should we as researchers uh, be asking? Uh, what kind of mix, what kind of mix do we need when we collaborate? So um, who should we be collaborating with and what, what should be the nature of collaboration and what mix of collaboration will produce the optimal outcome? So um, if I take the example of the alcohol um, issue, for instance, um, it seems to me, and this leads me to the second issue that I will be talking about, it seems to me that the issue that is at stake here is the issue of power. And power uh, for us who are working in health promotion know that that is one of the most central issues in health promotion. And, and then the question is, I think uh, it was Maurice that mentioned, that talked about the balance of power, how uh, different government ministers were uh, coming in and out and how some were in support and how some were not in support. What is it that the other industries, the cigarette industry, the alcohol industry, what is it that they have that we do not have? Is it just simply money or do they have better uh, ways of handling their issues uh, that we don't have? And these are the things that I think we should be thinking around and asking us researchers to work together with practitioners on to find solutions to. Um, Peter raised an issue around um, evaluation, how difficult evaluation is for these projects. Um, again, though it's difficult, I think these are areas where us as researchers and practitioners and even policymakers should collaborate and find ways of evaluating collaborative projects, intervention projects that give us a better sense of how we should be approaching this in the future. So um, both speakers spoke a lot about research, there's the need for more research. And I think this is one of the ways that we can take this forward. Apart from doing sort of research, just documenting, you know, what is how alcohol or cigarette smoking or, or any of the other issues is affecting society, I think our documenting our collaboration, um, just like some of the uh, slides that uh, Peter presented uh, from some of the research that was done by the SOPH, um, more of that kind of research and trying to find, re use research to find the right mix of collaboration or the right mix of factors that will produce optimal results might help us move forward. And again, I'll close with the issue of power. What mix of power, what kinds of power um, should we be exerting? And what mix of power should we be exerting? And how should we go about increasing our power as researchers in the health field of health promotion, as advocates in the field of health promotion? And how do we co opt policymakers and other practitioners? in this regard. I'll close there. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate your closing remarks. Uh, colleagues, uh, that's the end of it. Uh, thank you very much for uh, your presence. Uh, uh, we look forward to engage with you again, uh, most probably next year. Keep well and uh, keep advocating for health. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much for the opportunity. Wish you well. Thank you. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you. Take care. you too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.